Are you struggling to conceive? You have options, and at Piedmont Reproductive Endocrinology Group, we'll make sure you have the guidance and support you need. Preg is known for individualized fertility care that's unique to every patient. We take the time to provide a reassuring and empowering experience because we believe that you deserve nothing less. Let us help you on your journey to parenthood. Visit us at pregonline.com to learn more. Get the guidance and support you need at Piedmont Reproductive Endocrinology Group. Between aging and busy lifestyles, many women struggle with maintaining their physical and mental wellness. At Aquavita Concierge Healthcare Services for Women, we can help you revitalize your health and reclaim your life. We start from within by balancing your hormones, allowing your body to achieve and maintain desired weight goals. We also specialize in peptide therapies, regenerative medicine, sexual health, and aesthetics in our state-of-the-art facilities. Feel better, look better, live better at Aquavita. Visit aquavitality.com and begin your journey today. Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Join us as we seek the truth and travel the long road to justice. Hey everybody, it's Tuesday. Time for another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. What's good, Fruit Loop? Rain. Oh man, we did an arc. Rain, rain, and more rain. (laughs) It is uh, definitely dreary here, which is good because... There's a lot of documents for me to pour through. Yeah, you've been pouring through a ton. Uh, was up till I think around four this morning, and then I had to get up at seven to take my son somewhere, and been back at it. But it's all interesting stuff. It's worth it. Yeah, it's been. Uh, yeah, there's nothing super explosive in here, to be honest with you. Um, it it a lot of it is just um, kind of fills in some gaps though, and there are some little nuggets, and and I'm gonna tell you it's. This is going to be kind of a series of us pouring through these documents. Um, you're not going to go through everything in one or two episodes. So we, we're going to definitely be cranking out some of these in the future. Yep. So um, real quick, we want to give a big thank you to a couple of people who donated through PayPal, Carrie and Sandy. We really appreciate it. It was very unexpected. And, um, you know, it does help us uh, cover some of the cost of doing this. And, oh, and yeah. we do appreciate it. Um, if anybody else wants to do that, our email address is pretty lies and alibis at gmail.com. And really quickly, we just want to give a big shout out to our sponsor, Two Cool T-Shirt Quilts. So if you guys want to check them out, it's two cool t-shirt quilts.com slash pretty lies and alibis. Really cool. I'm working on my t-shirts, by the way. I'm still working on my t- It's such a hard decision. It's, yeah. I'm very sentimental. And so yeah. even though I can't fit in some of these shirts anymore because yeah, three kids later, and 40s it's really hard to even just put them in the mail but i know i will be so happy when i get it done so i I gotta do it yep all right so um so we got the valo documents yesterday all 2500 yeah it's a big dump it's a big dump um okay before we even get started justin lum was on this case from the very beginning yeah he he was so active in reaching out to them and trying to you know get answers clarify stuff which in the early days is is how we found out stuff and so you really do see how hard uh he worked uh, i mean it still does but so we just had to give justin a big shout out because he was rocking it yeah so um let's talk for a minute about Lori's nickname lolo yeah so Lori's family nickname for her is lolo and in hawaii or in hawaiian uh it means crazy very appropriate it is <laughs> all right so we are going to just jump right into these documents because um there's just so much so um what about you know we've always heard that charles was kind of keeping everybody up um and we had heard a lot about his phone bill that he had so many phones from Lori's family that he was paying for what was that phone bill the last one okay so august of 2019 his phone bill was a thousand seventy six dollars and 43 cents now, we don't know if some of the company phones are on this, but it gets expensive. I'm going to tell you, for me and my three kids, um, it's almost 300 a month. Yeah, you're looking, that's probably 10 people or so. And then you think iPads that have um, the cellular yep. option. Yep. We know JJ had an iPad. Um, so he, he was forking out lots of money. Yeah. <laughs> Every month. That's uh, two house payments. Basically. Oh my gosh, yeah. 
Yeah, that's a lot of money. Or two car payments. I'm going to say not house payments. Yeah, not around here anymore. That's Greenville's true. exploded and yeah. the rent here, I mean, you don't find anything halfway decent under what, 1500 Yeah. a month. And that's sometimes that's an apartment. Yep. All right. So um, in an email that was sent on July 23rd, 2019, which is 12 days after Charles was murdered, um, a detective was responding to questions from one of Charles's sons explaining where they were in the investigation into his dad's murder. Um, one thing we did learn is Alex was able to legally possess firearms, but I'm going to run through this part real quick. Um, can I just say Charles's sons are so um, articulate and well-spoken. Um in, in what I've seen in their communications, they seem like good good boys. Yeah. And I mean, they're just trying to get answers because we know Lori wasn't telling them anything. No. So this is a week later. Yeah. Um, and I didn't put this in the notes, but there were concerns for their safety because at one point Lori is trying to find their address. He, she keeps asking them their address, probably to send... What, she said she had some watches of Charles's or something? Well, yeah, they had asked for the really good ones, and she sent them, like, the Timex, whatever it was. Yeah, yeah. but, you know, during this period, they were terrified, and rightfully so. Yeah, um, well, I think um, Adam and Zach Cox were as well. Oh, they yeah. they weren't sure. They were. Um, yeah. They were a target as well. And Well, I'm sure after the murder, I mean, even before, you know that things are way out in left field, but when Charles is murdered... I mean, then they have to know these people are bona fide crazy. Yeah, I would think that Kay and them were in the same boat. I, they kind of, I would, I would think they thought the same thing. Maybe, but Kay was just pushing so hard uh, to, to try to make contact with JJ that if she was scared, she put it to the side to try yeah, to see her grandson. I, I still, I wouldn't mess with her. Uh uh-uh. uh I could see Kay saying, "You bring it down here. Come I down think, here in Louisiana." I think. Uh, you know, life or death is kind of the options right now. I say we have like a third option of just let Kay alone in the cell with the two of them for an hour. I'm game. I just want to be there. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to see it. We could make it like a pay-per-view. That'd be huge. That would. Be, I would pay to see it. Yeah. All right. So we're going to go through this email real quick. He says, I hope all is well with you and thank you so much for your team's efforts. While I understand you can only share certain information with us, we had a few questions. Alex is a convicted felon. And um, he was able to obtain a gun, most likely illegally. We are concerned for our family's safety safety, and would like to have a protection of order in place. And according to, and it's redacted, we found pictures on Facebook of Alex going down to Columbia, South America in 2016. He was wondering if any of them had travel restrictions on them since in the week since the murder. And then he was inquiring if there were any charges filed yet. Yeah, which are good questions. Yep. So what was the response on that? Um, so, and I think we covered this in a previous podcast, but I, Alex was a convicted felon, but he completed the terms of his probation, which reduced the charge to misdemeanor. That's crazy. Um, so he was legally carrying his firearm. Yep. Um, there wasn't any travel restrictions um, on anyone involved in the case uh, because at this time there's not probable cause to arrest them. Um, I'm guessing that the Columbia trip was by chance as he was on vacation for a few weeks at the time of this incident. Um, we are still working on the case and anxiously awaiting the cell phone records that they had requested under a search warrant. Yeah. And then he just goes on to say he'll keep in touch with them, uh, with the progress. Um, and he's hopeful to receive these records any day and reached out to them and would reach out to them and follow up, um, uh, if anything else comes up, please feel free to call or email. Yeah, and I think the thing to note is, if you remember right after this, Lori, of course, texts the boys, your dad's dead, um, and doesn't answer their questions. Like, how? What happened? Yeah, who and, tells a, a kid that in a text? Uh, people like Lori. I mean, seriously, at least call his mom. Yeah, there's um, like two big no-nos. You don't yeah. break up in a text, and you don't tell people somebody's dead in a text, especially their yeah. father. It's just... Yeah. You know, it's like, come on, be an adult. But she couldn't because she was guilty of something. Oh, yeah. So it's easier to text because if she gets on the phone, then maybe she gets stuck. Yeah. Can't answer something. So um, I've tried to keep this in chronological order. It's There's so many files. And sometimes I found duplicates. And then you have to open every file individually. I have not found a way to just scroll through. So I'm trying to do this in order. It's going to take a while. But... This was an email, um, August 17th, 2019. Now, at this point, Tylee, JJ, Tammy are alive. This is ab- you know, a little over a month after Charles was shot and killed. 
This is when she got to FaceTime JJ. Um, and if you remember, she said it was very brief. So we're just going to kind of skim through this. She says they were able to FaceTime him yesterday. It lasted 36 seconds. And she says when he calls often, it's not unusual for him to quickly hang up, but then he'll call back and hang up five or ten times. He's adorable. We have not seen her talk to him in approximately two weeks. Um, she says the contact has been short like it was that day before. She said he's very easy to manipulate, and his um, diabolical homicidal mother knows this. And can I just say, pouring through these documents, Kay Woodcock should be a profiler. <laughs> yeah. She had all of them pegged from the very beginning. Yeah. Even if you see here, this is before the kids are missing or dead. And she said, Di- diabolical homicidal mother. Yeah. It's just crazy to read it now, knowing what comes after. Um, she says when he calls, his voice is always exuberant and loud. She said he was subdued on that call and they were excited to see him, but they were really worried about his lack of enthusiasm. I wonder, is that hinting maybe he was getting extra medicine or something? I don't know. Um, I mean, maybe, it, but then again, if, if, Things are crazy at this point because at one point Lori leaves JJ with with Charles for over a month and then all of a sudden she's back in the picture and then he goes back with her and then he doesn't see his dad and and he doesn't know as far as we know he d- didn't know his dad was murdered or dead. No, he did. Didn't didn't they tell him that Charles had went to heaven or something? I don't know. I'll have to go back and look. But I'm sure just with his age and the fact that he had autism it had to have just been internally so hard for him to process all this. So maybe that could have account for, for, you know, his behavior. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. It just means, I mean, it just means, it just sounds to me like, I don't know, something's up. I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's all um, really unfortunate because um, you see through these, like this here showed me that the toll on JJ was apparent and then if you look at the picture of him at Bear World, it's very apparent. He's just staring off in the distance. It doesn't look like he's excited. Um, at that point, everything had changed. New town, sisters disappeared, hadn't seen dad in months. Mom's not being attentive, it seems. You know, probably just keeping him fed at that point. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I just, I, I, I hate to think what his little mind had to try to process in those last couple of months. Just too much. Too much for a, an adult. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so she goes on to say, last night I requested from Lori, she had emailed and texted her permission to visit JJ and Phoenix that next weekend. And she said she knew it would probably go unanswered, but she was trying. Um, she thought they might still be in the area due to Melanie and Brandon getting divorced. Um, and she thought maybe Melanie couldn't move because of the, the child visitation restrictions for her. So, um, she, she kind of acknowledges that, that she's heard Melanie is in a cult with Lori, and that was the root of the problem, which led to their divorce, Melanie and Brandon's divorce. Yeah. So that last paragraph, she says that somebody told me recently, Lori doesn't want JJ. He ties her down, and she can't handle him anymore. And a friend of Charles, um, who did not know Lori's family, that Kay had spoke with, told, him, told her the same thing. Yeah. And then she realizes it triggers something in her that Charles had told her the same thing. Yeah. So I'm sure at this point with you, you've got multiple people, including your then murdered brother saying she doesn't want JJ. Um, you see why Kay was freaked out very early on. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, when you hear that. Yeah. And, and she said that she tried to tell Charles that Lori only said it to hurt him and she didn't mean it. And at that point, I guess that's what you would think. I mean, things hadn't really, you had the murder of Charles, but Kay was on to it. Sounds like she was trying to keep Charles kind of pumped up or just keep him positive. I'm sure he was very down with all this stuff happening. Oh yeah. Yeah. Most definitely. Um, and I think she says there, it's just her being gullible. Yeah. Cause you want to think good. You want to think that she does have his best interests at heart. Well, I mean, you don't, and like she says, she couldn't imagine a mother feeling that way. Right. And at this point, Lori has legal custody of JJ. So Kay is somewhat at the mercy of Lori when it comes to the, to him. So, you know, I, I think Kay was as polite as she could have been in this whole situation after you read the text that she sent to Lori. Yeah. So, um, we're, okay, I'm sorry. Ooh, uh, my uh, brain's foggy. 
she talks about um then it hit her that when Lori split on January 30th that that's why JJ's clothes were gone too. Mhm. Um she said it puzzled her since it happened. She took Charles and JJ's belongings because she was going to keep the house but didn't want either one of them. Yep. That makes sense. Yep. And that's what Kay said. It all makes sense now and she said that this epiphany really kind of uh, heightened the concern they had for JJ's well-being. And she um she had contacted the school um and she had also reached out to the attorney um when Charles and Lori started the divorce proceedings that February, which Charles didn't follow through. Remember, they had that brief reconciliation in Texas. Yeah, he was on uh, one of those datelines, I think. Mm -hmm. And Kay was looking into having court-ordered visitation if necessary. Now, courts will do that. They will do um, sometimes when divorces get messy and parents try to keep the child or children from grandparents. There is a, a clause in there where you can go in and successfully argue that grandparents have a right to kids too, as it should be. Um, you know, it's still the the one thing that just boggles my mind. And we talked about this on the last episode is back when Lori was making her whole family hate. Well, I don't want to say make them. I mean, they chose to hate Charles or treat him the way. But the fact that they left JJ out too, man, it just tells you all you need to know. Yep, they wouldn't contact him. It's just oh. So um, she goes on to say that Lori's just mad and. Kay kind of felt like maybe some of her cult friends were trying to intimidate her on LinkedIn, which is a business, kind of like a business for Facebook page or yeah. like a Facebook page for business people. Um, and Kay said, I would, you know, I wish she would call and ask for money if she gives us JJ. In other words, Kay just wants the kid back at that point. Yeah. And yeah, she's wanting to see him. But yeah. Uh-huh. Um, so anyways, it just kind of goes through and, and, and she ends it with, I pray you're making useful progress with your case. So that's kind of um, in the early days, sadly, before the ki- the kids were murdered. Um, man, it's just very foreshadowing. Everything that she feels in this email is just kind of, you know, the danger was there. Yep. And and, and the worry was warranted. Yep. Now we're going to get into cell phone pings. Yeah, just briefly. There's not really a ton on this, um, and I haven't gotten that far yet. Um, but Lori's phone was pinged in West Yellowstone on September the 8th. 2019 at 109 p.m. Um, so they confirmed, you know, back in the early days, that's that's how they, I guess, were figuring out what was happening here. Yeah, well, you had the picture, too. Yeah, that yeah. was released, I think, like February of last year. It, I remember yeah. we were shocked because we hadn't heard anything new, and then all of a sudden you have this picture of Tylee and JJ yeah. with Alex in the background. Yep. All right, so what about March 6th? So, email from March 6, 2020, where investigators are pinging phones from the day before the attempt on Tammy's life in the driveway. Uh, if you remember, that's the one where it seemed somebody misfired or the gun didn't fire or something. Yeah. And uh, so, they note that on 10-8-2019, the day before she was shot at, Chad only communicated with Lori and Alex. That's surprising. I mean, it's not surprising, but... Sounds like they were up to something, obviously. Oh, yeah. I, I can't wait to see what Idaho has. Oh, my gosh. Because you're talking about, I want to get these text messages that are relevant to up there. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. Do you just see these little snippets here? You know it's good what they got up there. Oh, yeah. So, on an email on March the 6th, 2020, these, were, these emails were between investigators who were pinging Alex's phone the night Tammy was shot at. And they say it's a subscribe phone, so that's one they can verify he had. There were a lot of burner phones, obviously. That phone stayed near the the apartment. So you kind of wonder, was he using a burner phone or just left his phone there? Yeah. So um, it says here they give the last four digits of that phone, 9120. It appears to stay at or near the apartments during the attempted shooting. It makes an outbound text at 916 to Lori. And they did the math, and it said that it was about a 10-minute drive from the townhomes to Chad's. And so, what happens next? Uh, it shows up again at 2328 military time. So, what is that? Uh, uh, 11, 11, 28. Yeah, 1130. Oh, um, we did the math. Ooh. Uh, when it sends an outbound text to somebody. It's redacted. It's redacted. The big black box. Yeah. And so they just go on to say that they can't see the tower that's associated with the text because it's on Verizon. Um, but they do have Google location information during that time period. 
and um, they can they can put his phone at the um, let's see they can put his phone at the apartment from nine twenty three p.m. until eleven forty three p.m. Yeah. And we, I mean, we've seen some of that before, too. So. Yeah, some of this stuff, we've seen snippets. And then, like I say, a lot of this is just filling in little things that were released in the past. You know uh, what I'm saying? It, yeah. it, it's not like there's any, oh, my gosh, look at this. It's not that. But it, for to be able to kind of build a better timeline and get a clearer picture of some things, it's it's been useful. I haven't even begun to kind of put it together. Yeah. This is going to be a big project. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So, in an email on March 6, 2020, they were reviewing cell phone pings from Lori, Chad, and Alex, uh, likely on October 9, 2019. Um, Chad was pinged there at 1.20, staying an hour. They also noticed that Chad is texting Lori and Alex. Yep. And so, they go on to say, can anyone point out where the individual units were for Lori, Alex, and Melanie that they rented in the complex? They're trying to see if they have any ring doorbell footage from October the 9th, which is the day Tammy was shot at in the driveway. Uh, it looks like Chad's phone possibly came to the apartment complex around 1.20 and stayed about an hour. It doesn't say they're using military time, so I assume this is 1.20 in the afternoon. Um so that then this had a uh, kind of a cell phone ping map that showed um, the three of them where they were, mm-hmm. where the phones were. Yeah. Um, so there's a picture, right? Yeah. And, and I think I might have put that out there. I mean, the goal for me is to get all this stuff up eventually on the website um, so that people can kind of go through it for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So, jumping down, while in Springfield for Tammy's funeral, Chad was texting Lori. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Um, And they, it says here, I'd call this a clue. Yeah. So, they're starting to kind of, you know, at this point, there's something going on. Yeah. Um, He starts making calls on October the 8th, and he only communicates with Lori's known phone and Alex's burner phone. And, um, that's suspicious. <laughs> that's weird. weird. <laughs> <laughs> we say that all the time around here. It's your daughter. I know. That's yeah. suspicious. <laughs> um, so it looks like the 401, which is uh, Chad's phone, it travels down to Utah for Tammy's funeral. And it looks like Chad possibly stayed at the Holiday Inn Express in Springville, Utah. They mapped that out. Um, but yeah, so he was there and he paid for four rooms at that Holiday Inn in Springfield, according to his bank records. And I'm sure for the funeral, you know. Yeah. Um, they were going to pull the registry to kind of confirm that. One thing that I thought was kind of crazy is um, they were able to determine that the money that Lori, the card that Lori used when she gave to the mortuary, I guess, for for Charles's cremation, um, not too long after that, she bought Chad a plane ticket with that same card. Well, a dumb dumb. Oh, yeah. Sheesh. Um, so, in an email dated, what, 11 2019 mm-hmm. investigators in Rexburg were trying to find a way to get Alex into custody, possibly using a convicted felon in possession of a firearm uh, to accomplish that. Uh, the goal was to put pressure on him regarding JJ's whereabouts. Yep, and they, in the email, it says... Um, they want to see if they can get a court certified copy of the conviction where he was arrested and put in jail or yeah, put in jail for attacking Joe Ryan. Um, so they were trying to look at state or federal felon in possession charges to maintain the guns and get Alex into custody on the charge and see if they could get any information about JJ and, and just kind of add some pressure there. And they acknowledge he's not going to say anything if JJ's harmed, uh, but it may help if they, at the time, they still didn't know if they were just concealing the children yeah. or if something had happened to them. Um, so it's, I mean, unfortunate. It's just weird to see that they were wanting to try to get him in that early. And then they were following him like right up until he died. Him and Zulema, the, the, they were t- tailing him. Yeah. My thing is this, like why, I mean, couldn't you pull him over for a failure to turn your blinker on? Yeah, but you can't detain him. Yeah. 
You oh, can't. Man. I mean, it would have to be voluntary. They would, and you see that a lot on the first forty-eight. So what they'll do is, if they have a suspect that they have in mind, but they don't have enough evidence to arrest them on something related to the case, they'll always check and see if they have any outstanding warrants, because then they can bring them in on that, and then start talking about the main thing, which would obviously be a homicide. Um, and sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. But clearly, he didn't have any warrants out there, or they would have got him in. You you wonder what he? I don't think he would have died if he was in police custody. I still don't think it was nope. no natural death. Nope he done he done drunk some Kool Aid or something had something in it. Oh, uh, they were funneling the Kool Aid. Yeah, like straight down the the throat. My brother in law died suddenly, and now my sister and her kids have to sell their home. That's why I told my husband we could not put off getting life insurance any longer. An agent offered us a 10-year, $500,000 policy for nearly $50 a month. Then we called SelectQuote. SelectQuote found us identical coverage for only $19 a month, a savings of $369 a year. Whether you need a $500,000 policy or a $5 million policy, Select Quote could save you more than 50% on term life insurance. For your free quote, go to SelectQuote.com. SelectQuote.com. That's SelectQuote.com. Select Quote. We shop, you save. Full details on example policies at SelectQuote.com slash commercials. Lucky Land Casino asking people what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. So this was interesting to me. It says in an email... Um, Oh, wait, wait, I just, my my paper just went crazy. Um, So on November uh, 26, 2019, there's an email where an investigator asked for the number Alex was in touch with during the the shooting of Charles that came back to a Hispanic female who I assume is Ulema. They want to see if that number was connected to any money transfers because they found out that um, Alex had made three transfers to somebody in Columbia, South America over the course of a couple of years so they were just trying to connect those dots there yeah if you remember he went there and uh, i mean they that one lady spoke out and talked about he was like at a dating thing or something oh yeah they had that yeah that's right he met her on some dating app that i forgot about that yep she was it was some kind of dating thing where she was like i don't want to say over it but she was for some reason she set it all up it was with a company or something, I think. Uh-huh. That's yeah. right. And yeah. then he asked her out. Mm-hmm. Because I think yeah. the one didn't show or something. I don't know. That is exactly right. I forgot. Yeah. Um, so, anyways, uh, yeah, they, they never... I haven't found anything where they followed up about these money transfers. I'll be interested to see kind of deep in these documents if that's ever brought up again. Um, on November 29th, 2019, investigators were emailing back and forth. They were looking into... Uh, border crossings travel for Alex, Lori, and Tylee. So this is, um, the kids are missing at this point, but this is in relation, I think, to to, um, see if maybe they hid the kids out of the country. And um, one thing they mentioned, they were looking to see if anyone had traveled to Orlando, which they had not. The last time that Alex went out of the country was on that July 14th, right after Charles was shot. And he returned on the 19th. And that's when he went down to Columbia. They confirmed he did go out of the country for that week. Or it was actually five days. I just, uh, in looking back at this, like it, it talks about Lori's Hawaii driver's license. Mm, oh, yeah, they did find, uh, they had a copy of that. I, I put that on our social media. Yeah. My question, when you move state to state, like when you get a new license, you turn the other one in. Yeah. But, well, I, I told a story, remember on the last one about how I didn't, I kept an extra one. Um, yeah, you're supposed to, but yeah, I know when I moved, I did like, well, she used that Hawaii driver's license to get the PO box that she shared with Alex too. Yeah. That was her ID. Um, so anyways, her last border crossing was in September of 2017 where she went to Cancun and they didn't find that JJ ever was out of the country. Yeah. So, so we moved October 27th, 2019, and this is from Kay. 
And this is, you have to understand, this is after Tammy dies. And so now, understandably, Kay is like, whoa, (laughs) this is not a coincidence. No, no. So Kay emailed investigators on October 27th, 2019 and says to contact her ASAP because numerous things are happening that have bearing on Charles's murder. Yep. Had to be very scary to see Tammy had died because I think at that point and we see it Lori just understands this is these people are killing people and at that point she don't know where JJ is oh yeah so oh man I just do not envy their journey gosh no um there's some little nuggets in there about Brandon and Melanie though there are um so apparently um Brandon had given Melanie three hundred thousand dollars for a divorce settlement in the recent past. Now this is in October, 2019. Um, just like before Lori moved and before they attempted his murder, it says here, Melanie is obviously the new golden goose since they murdered Charles. They'll run through that money quickly. But Brandon found out Melanie stopped their divorce proceedings two days before the attempted murder on him. And Kay totally nails it. She couldn't collect his life insurance if a divorce is pending. Oh yeah. So that bing, makes total sense. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, she also mentions that Alex has quit his job. She doesn't know where he is, and she theorizes that maybe he's hiding with Lori and JJ, which had to be terrifying, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the thing about Melanie and Brandon, I mean, Melanie doing all that stopping the divorce proceedings, I mean, it's it's telling and she sat on tv and i did not know nothing about it i asked him did you attempt to shoot brandon oh yeah i just (laughs) did you attempt to kill brandon oh boy oh yeah Yeah. Uh well we shall see because i think that that's a lie yeah um when rexburg executed the search warrants at the townhomes they found a large number of firearms in alex's unit i didn't know that that was new that that was new to me i knew the one but doesn't surprise me but i didn't know it no i mean I saw how he handled guns and stuff. So Yeah, and so they did some research to see if he was a, you know, if he shouldn't have been in possession, which would have given them an end to charge and, and bring him in. But um, so they had done some, um, just kind of some research on them, and that's where they found the money transfers for Alex. Um, so on December 5th, 2019, this is when law enforcement was following Alex and Zulema. And this is one week before he died. So they're on him, which now to me, it explains why the FBI was at that autopsy the next day. It's why you had all these really important people showing up at the scene at Zulema's house. Because if you remember, when we went through all that body cam footage, you, we were trying to make out the, you know, remember all that? It was just oh, yeah. so painful. Yeah. But the officers are sort of picking up on the fact that there are big people there. And so you kind of hear them whisper a couple of times. And, and so now it makes sense because they were following them and they, at this point, they were looking for ways to bring him in. Yeah. So you can imagine their shock when they find out he's dead. Weren't they having that meeting? Wasn't that? Oh yeah, it was something. That and, big, like yeah. all agency meeting or something, or I don't know, they yep. were, they were doing something and then they find out Alex is dead. Oh yeah. So, um. And we also know in December of 2019 is when investigators started getting in touch with Social Security. So this stuff was going on. You know, a lot of the things that we've just learned in the last couple of months, you see now back in December of 2019, way before they even found the kids. And really right around the time where it kind of went mainstream media, they're already looking at Social Security. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um. So, yeah, the next email is just, um, it's about Alex's death, and it's just a update, and, and they talk about him being deceased as of um, 419 on the 12th, as of yesterday. Um, he was found lab- with labor breathing and unresponsive. They talk about, and we saw all this on the body cam, Zulim and her family refused to provide statements, but they talked to the initial officers that showed up, and they talk about how they're going to review the body cam footage and try to obtain more statements. Yep. Um, I like this This on the bottom. It says, this is the case that keeps on giving. Yeah, it is. Right, I know. Yeah. It, and it is. And it will keep giving because, you know, as crazy as all this is, we still don't know the worst details yet, which is going to be 
the murders of the kids and Tammy and the cause of death. And, you know, there's just so much more. And I really, really feel for the families. Because even these documents, you know, we've been a little selective about some things that we put out there because some of it's just not relevant. Um, But these are human beings that are dealing with this tragedy. And that was one thing Kresha said on our live, which is it's just, it's consuming. Oh, yeah. And then you're doing okay, and then boom. Something drops. These documents drop, and then I'm sure it has to take them all back to the early days. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So what about social media accounts? So Lori and Alex had Snapchat accounts. Uh, Tylee and Alex had Skype accounts. Um, Alex and Melanie uh, Pulowski have WhatsApp accounts. Which WhatsApp, here's the thing. That's a very private text messaging service. And it's really, I know law enforcement can issue subpoenas to get it, but WhatsApp, um, you can delete those texts and they're very hard to recover. So it shows me that that um, Melanie Pulowski, who's a lot younger, probably was up on what was safe. And WhatsApp is, um, I've heard that's like the app of drug dealers. Wow. Yeah, because it's it's hard, really hard to recover those texts. Yeah, but Lori and Melanie also had Venmo accounts. Yeah, and we know that because we were back looking at some of the transfers. Oh, yeah. um, Where she was pretending to be Tylee after she was dead, sending money to Colby. So, JJ's school, man, I feel so sorry because you and I both have worked in a school setting with with special needs kids. And um, it's full of people that have the biggest hearts. And I'm sure they were scared for JJ at this point, not knowing where he was. But they're just emotional, and, and they're talking to investigators. Yeah, so when you work with special needs kids, it's a different type teacher. All teachers are, are called and are awesome. But when you work with these kids, it's definitely a calling, so you get attached to them. You do. And, I mean, when you're with them that much time during the day, it's you're, you, you know them in a lot of ways uh, as good as their parents do. And parents trust you. It's. It, I always loved working with the parents because we were just always on the same page. Yeah, they knew we loved their kid, and we knew these parents were doing their best to to help their kid progress. Well, I think too, you build more. Um, uh, I don't say a bond, but just a relationship with with parents of special needs because you have the meetings and yeah, the you IP discuss meetings. the kids. Yeah, mm-hmm. what works, what doesn't. Um, right, and there's just a collaboration I think between special needs educators and parents that's just not there in yeah. regular ed because it has to be. But at the same time, you're a teacher, you're a caregiver. And sometimes you're performing basic duties with these kids, so they, they just become like yours. I love my old students. In fact, I still get together with one every month for coffee. Yeah, I still see several of mine. Yeah, I just, um, you know, they, they will. some of these kids will be a part of my life forever, and I love that. Yeah. And it's really cool because now some of them are little adults, and, you know, um, one girl, she graduated my last year working there, and, and we helped her get a job, and she still has that job. And, you know, so you, I'm so proud of them. When I see them accomplish something, it just, my heart swells. Oh, yeah. So I don't think even after the school year ends, you know. Yeah. Well, exactly. Well, when looking at this, I mean, they're concerned for their safety, too. Yeah, because they, this lady says they were brought into this nightmare situation. And at one point, they're worried that Lori's going to show up with her crazy self. Yeah. And, and the staff member says, are you confident we are safe? Should we be doing anything different? Individuals are scared due to her irrational behavior and doomsday talk. And then the investigator says, hey, look, she's in Hawaii. We know this. You guys are good. Yeah. But so, still, I mean, they're responsible and they want to keep their kids safe. Exactly. I mean, they, these guys have enough to worry about on a daily basis. This school was all special needs kids. There is so much safety and just you have to keep your eyes on these kids 24-7. So to have to to have to have deal with this on top of everything, yeah, I feel, I feel so bad for these staff members. Oh, yeah. Um, so, again, we've we talked about this before that um, one of the staff members said that Lori was accessing JJ's class app, Bloom's three different ways on a phone an ipad and whatever else yeah they, they didn't specifically say what devices but it seemed to be that you know phone ipad that kind of thing and so in an email on december 17 2019 investigators were talking about tally's facebook account and they said there wasn't a lot there but there is something glaring and that is her facebook was accessed from california and kansas and this was what we know now to be after she was deceased 
Yeah, that's weird. That is very weird. She was also using Tally's iPods at some point in November, too. <laughs> Just Jeez. tacky. Golly. Um, so in an email from February 14, 2020, JJ School was trying to get the IP addresses of where his account was accessed from. Uh, she tells the investigator that the media has been in touch with them. They released a statement, but also said they wouldn't comment any further until the matter is resolved. Um, she says they can sleep knowing they did what they could to advocate for JJ. Yeah. Yep. So it's just, and they were having an issue at this point with the media contacting them. Um, and, and the investigator gave them some very sound advice, which is the media is going to take advantage of you and just cut them off because the attention will eventually go away. Um, these guys don't want to have to deal with all this. They, they're dealing with their students and, on top of that, and most importantly, they're worried about JJ, who they know and love. Yeah. So I want to give a big thank you to uh, Awen Reese for sending me a very clear copy of a document that I could not make out. And I tweeted about this yesterday, and we got a lot of interesting, a lot of interest in it. And um, which is Dan Judd is somebody. Now let's just keep in mind this is a guy that that claims to have inherited the lost 116 pages of the Book of Mormon. But he did get my, my ears up at one point. He had gotten a message to detectives saying that, well, that Lori and Alex were raising money for a legal fight by selling meth. <laughs> okay, so I don't know that I believe all that. But he had a really good point. And the, I researched this, and um, it says he believes Tammy was killed with something called pure beta. Well, I look it up, and it's kind of like a beta blocker. Too much of that causes heart failure. Huh. Now, I can tell you, we have been told that Tammy was not poisoned. Huh. So, I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't take what this guy says as, as fact, but I'm still curious how she died. Yeah, he sounds a little out there. but Oh, yeah. Well, he's got the 116 lost pages of the Book of Mormon. <laughs> he He's past left field. Like, he's yeah. in a parking lot. Yeah. So, Ian reached out to detectives on behalf of Melanie saying she wanted to clear her name. She also wanted to see if she could arrange Christmas gifts to be sent to her children through a third party. At this time, she was not allowed to see or contact them. Yeah, and I mean, look, Melanie totally chose these wackadoodles over her babies, um, which blows my mind that now she has a fifth kid. Um, how sad that at Christmas you have to arrange through a detective to get your kid Christmas gifts because you're part of a cult. Oh, yeah. Ugh. Yeah. So um, in an email, um, Melanie had reached out to this investigator through her husband, Ian. She wanted to do the right thing and help clear her name and that she has a lot of information but was hesitant prov to provide it in an interview setting at, th at this time. And she blames her bad experience with the police. Wow. Uh, okay. She said she wa I mean, I wonder if her bad experience is the fact that she got arrested because she was trespassing and making a fool of herself banging on Brandon's dad's door. That's not a no bad clue. experience with the police. It's a bad experience with being a good mom. I think that has to stem from her when she was younger with the custody with her dad and her mom and all that stuff. Yeah, it all bleeds over. Yeah. I mean, into adulthood or whatever. Yeah. Um, she she was getting na nasty texts from people um, wanting to know about what was going on with Chad and Lori. So that's why she wanted to clear her name, I guess. And um, she had two issues. She wanted to see if she could get back some personal property from Rexburg, which included a computer. Doubt it. You're going to give her a computer. You know they're searching that thing. Oh, yeah. And um, they have the computer at that point, but they hadn't got a warrant yet to search them. So. And the second was uh, about the, the Christmas gifts. Um, they had heard from Ian. These investigators had heard from Ian that Melanie was planning to get some legal advice from Chad and Lori's attorney. And, uh, but she didn't say any, they didn't say anything about um, her being represented. And they had never heard from any attorney on Melanie's behalf. Um, so they just weren't sure. But here's the kicker. Essentially, Melanie wanted, I think, if I understand this correctly, to do a written statement to police and then only answer questions based on that written statement. Huh. And to me, that just tells me she's going to be prepared for those questions. Oh, yeah. And if she didn't want them to stray off that, then she don't want the hard questions that how she's going to answer truthfully. Exactly. If I don't have anything to hide, you can ask me anything. Yep. Um. So January 8, 2020, Melanie was supposed to meet with investigators but didn't show up. Um, in an email on March 10, 2020, 
Between investigators, it, it is said Melanie's talking with authorities is not as she professes it to be. They confirm that she is pregnant. Yeah, so somebody who knew Melanie was in contact with investigators, and uh, she had been in contact with Melanie, and um, so apparently Melanie had been telling this person, hey, I'm cooperating, I'm good, don't talk bad about me. And the, the investigator's like, nah, that's not the case. <laughs> Lies. Wow, liar. Lies. Liabetes. Yeah. Um, so around January of 2020, the media had really started hounding the police departments, the investigators, people that knew these guys. Um, so the investigator just responds back to this person who knew Melanie and said they hope that she'll come forward with the truth, but they feel like she's in very deep with this group. And because of her relationship with Lori, she would probably take secrets to the grave. Um, wow. And it says here, this group will place the dark person tag on anyone that conflicts with their current belief system. You should hear the things they have called us. If it weren't for the death and missing children, it would be quite comical. They just can't seem to understand how misguided they really are. So, yeah, I mean. How, how can you just, just take stuff with you to the great when you know it's wrong? And you know there's been death after death murder after murder i think the reason you do it is because you're implicated and you're going to end up in jail too yeah i mean yeah. otherwise you come clean and do anything you can and give any tiny piece of information to to an investigator that might if she truly didn't know where the kids were yeah um then she would be doing everything she could to help them find the kids so yeah she's at this point you have to remember they've ditched melanie alex is dead so it's melanie and ian and so this exchange is, is, I'm sure she'll feel even more alone in the future, at near future, as Chad and Lori may go deeper into hiding. With all of this TV coverage, they're going to start cutting ties with people they know and suspect are being, wa are being watched. And the investigator's glad that this person has a connection with her. And he says, and, and we know this to be very true, the entire investigation is a marathon and not a splint. A sprint. Oh, <laughs> my God. Dude, I need a, I'm, I'm taking a nap, and I might not wake up till tomorrow. <laughs> um, and they say, you know, at this point, the sooner they can verify the safety of the kids, the better. So that's kind of where I got to. Um, there's so much, guys. There are hundreds of pages about the message boards from um, preparing a people and all that stuff. Uh, there's a lot of redactions about Zulema. Um, but I, I have a feeling I haven't scratched the surface yet. Yeah. So it's just crazy. I think we're going to try to maybe do another one tomorrow. Is that right? Because you're, yeah. you're out of town this weekend. Yeah. So if we can maybe get one more in tomorrow, that would be good. And then that'll give me a few days to kind of pour through this and really start picking out, you know, some little nuggets. Yep. And then we'll come back at you next week with some more. So that's kind of all we had. Um, we just want to say welcome to all of our new followers. We have had a ton. Just yesterday, once we got the documents, um... We gained a lot of new followers across social media, so we just want to say that we're happier with us. And uh, to all of our old, the the OGs, we appreciate you guys so much. Yeah, you guys are awesome. Y'all have been so kind. I mean, we get so many nice messages and inboxes and comments, and uh, we definitely feel the love. And, and um, you know, this podcast is growing by the day, and so we're just grateful for all of you that have, that have facilitated that, because otherwise we'd be sitting here talking to seven people like day one. Hey, I'm going to be honest, like some of these other things when they go live and people comment, there's like rude comments. Yeah. And I but mean, ours I, isn't like that. Oh, well, we've had a few. Yeah. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't too bad though. Yeah. No. And it's okay. I mean, like we've said from the beginning, we are not for everybody. We're well, I mean like attacking whoever's on like. Oh yeah. 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 But I, I, I do. Our base is so cool. I mean, the Summer Wells groups that I have seen. Oh my gosh. It's just vicious. I mean, personal attacks and. And you're right. You do see that sometimes on other lives. But we really appreciate you guys keeping it classy because, you know, we just don't want to be any source of drama or pain for any family. And we take what we do very seriously, which is why we kind of go through this stuff before we just put it out there because we don't ever want to be the source of pain nope. or rumor or speculation because, you know, I, I think a lot of people fail to realize that, you know, for us, we, well, I mean, for us, we understand that what we do is a responsibility and what we put out there, you know, it has the ability to be spread around. So we just try to try to try to do it right. And that's why these documents are slow to be tweeted and Facebooked out because 
We don't want to put any investigator or FBI's phone number or email on there. I'll tell you, there is a lot of documents where psychics called in. I mean, you see kind of the, the tips and bogus tips and stuff like that that these investigators are having to deal with on top of trying to find these kids at this point. Yeah, and it makes sense why it takes the, the time it does. Yeah, I mean, we, we were all complaining months ago. Come on, guys. But now I'm like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. uh, I stayed up till 4 o'clock this morning, and I barely got anywhere in these documents. Yep. Imagine having to issue subpoenas and um, – get search warrants and have to wait for that stuff to be analyzed and so you see now i have a new respect for how these investigations play out it is very cumbersome yeah so anyways we will see you guys again tomorrow we're just gonna jump right back in i'm gonna keep an eye on our other cases if i see anything interesting we'll shoot it out there on social media but hope you guys have a good rest of your day and we will see you at some point tomorrow see ya Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered Chumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. The Chumba life is for everybody. So go to Chumbacasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Wells Fargo presents one of the surest ways to grow your money. A Wells Fargo CD account. Where you can earn a 5.00% annual percentage yield on an 11-month term with a minimum opening deposit of $5,000. Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash CD rates to open a CD account and start growing your savings with us. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC.